Welcome again to the Form Book Club. Today we're beginning the discussion of a book which is very important in itself and very timely also. It is by Robert Riley, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. I think this book is, I say, valuable in itself as a history of the founding of this country and its roots that go all the way back to Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome. But we're, we're doing these sessions now in the month of July 2020, which certainly is going to go down in history as a year of quite unusual happenings. Uh, but this book takes up a position in the ongoing debate among Catholic scholars as to whether the moral decline of our country, America, is a result of a flaw in the Constitution, a flaw in the founding, or whether it's a result of a departure from a disavowal of our founding principles. And Bob Rye is going to take the second position. It's important now, especially because of this whole cancel culture, statues being torn down, not just of Confederate heroes and generals, but of Lincoln, Washington, Columbus, Cervantes, uh, even Frederick Douglass, uh, the great abolitionist. Uh, so it's clear, and it's even been stated by some of these people, they're not opposing simply the racism that was experienced by the slaves in the South, but rather the very founding of this country uh, mm -hmm. as a racist uh, founding. Uh, and they seem to want to start all over again. But th this book, I think, uh, is, is a wonderful exposition of all the good that went into our founding, recognizing that there was evil as well because we're all subject to original sin. Anyway, before we actually start, uh, Vivian or Joseph, you want to say anything more about this? Well, I, I would just like to say in order to set the scene for myself as we move forward for the next four or five weeks, if we include the, the fact, the exciting news that the author will be joining us in the final session. Um, in the so far as this is new to me, not so much the intellectual history we see in chapter one, but you know, but the, the specific American history aspect of things is something I don't know much about. And I would say that I'm, um, I like the thesis, uh, Robert Riley's thesis, and I want it to be true. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm reading as I go, and so I'm, 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 I'm sort of I'm skeptically learning. So if I come across as the voice of, of skepticism, it's not the voice of cynicism. It's the voice of wanting clarification, which, of course, may well come later in the book. But as I'm reading this for the first time, I'm not to know that. Vivian? Well, I think that's a good place to be, Joseph. And I think what we have to recognize maybe from the get-go is that people of Christian faith uh, are going to see in the founding the things that arose from Christianity, the things that in fact would never have arisen without Christianity. And so, Joseph, kind of like your thesis a while ago about the true Christendom and the or the true England, or whatever, you know, without the Judeo-Christian faith, uh, then these ideas of freedom and uh, equality become unmoored, right? And so I think the founders even themselves recognize that without the practice of religion, this republic would not last. Well, and, and, they, and they said so explicitly. Yes, they did. Yes. And so uh, so that's something to keep in mind, too, that we do hope this is true. We, I happen to believe that it's true, that these rivers and tributaries of thought did combine with um, Christian faith, even if it were different variations on a theme. The fact is the founding principles did have a source in a well, but without the faith that supports that, these same ideas can be interpreted in a completely different way, and I think we have seen them interpreted in a different way by our courts, by activist organizations, and so on. And so, anyway, just that is kind of in the background, that when we start going duke to duke, uh, 
Joseph, <laughs> that we're, you know, there's a kind of set of assumptions that I'm operating on that I would like understood. Also, uh, very serendipitously, uh, Catholic World Report, the blog that some by Carl Olson and that Ignatius Press supports, uh, has just posted a symposium on this book, and it has 13 different recognized authors and scholars commenting on the book. And Joseph, you'll notice if you go to that blog, that there are crit criticisms as well as uh, support for the book. So I think it's a fascinating conversation. And we now have this book club and this symposium to help us, you know, enter into this matter. So if you want to find that symposium, it's at catholicworldreport.com. Just one word, catholicworldreport.com. Scroll down to where it says books, and you'll see this symposium. It's a, it's a wonderful contribution to the discussion. Well, I have, on these, this first introduction, you know, and the first chapter, I just have a lot of quotes I want to read. But uh, so... I'm going to start off, and you can interrupt me if you have ones before mine, okay? Okay. And some of them are pretty short, uh, but the point is that he, he, he describes very succinctly just what he's doing in this book, and so I think, I think it's worthwhile to listen to him, what he says. So in Roman numeral 15, uh, anybody prior to that, Roman numeral 15? That's the preface. He says, very first sentence, this is primarily a work of intellectual history, analysis, and synthesis. Skipping a few lines. My endeavor has been to trace some golden strains of thought as they threaded their way through history to the American founding. And then at the bottom of the page, the only possibility of extending this legacy is to understand it from its roots. That is what I'm trying to do here. So that's the general broad outline of his purpose, which I think is a, a very noble one. Then I want to go on to page two. Anything before page two? I have page two. Well, why don't you go first then? Well, I, I just think, that again, towards the top of page two, that's uh, the six lines down, five lines down. I think he encapsulates essentially the, the, the two ways of perceiving the issue. The drama hinges on two opposing conceptions of reality. Is it constituted by reason or by will? The answer will determine, in turn, whether law is the product of reason or of will. The political ramifications of this are enormous. Primacy of reason means that what is right flows from objective sources and nature and the transcendent, transcendent from what is, as Plato proposed. Primacy of will, on the other hand, means that that which is right flows from power, that will is a law unto itself. It is a conflict of might makes right versus right makes might. Knowledge of this sources Knowledge of the sources of these contending schools of thought is necessary to gauge accurately their influence on the character of American creation. I think he really does, in a nutshell, encapsulate the, the, the macro struggle going on in terms of philosophy and political philosophy in particular today. I wanted to quote the four lines ahead of that, but I don't have to now because what you quoted actually elaborates on those. But it, it's reason versus will uh, in the foundation of our country. Middle of that page, uh, what was thought to have been settled, however, is now unsettled. The reason for this is the national convulsion resulting from America's current more degraded condition, the effect of which is an identity crisis. So I, he, he wrote this long before this particular uh, manifestation of this identity crisis. At the bottom of the page, the quarrel can be posed by these questions. Was the American founding rooted in the Judeo-Christian heritage and natural law? Or was it infused with notions of the radical autonomy and the perfectibility of man, and therefore inimical to the Christian and natural law conception of reality? Was the founding America's original sin? 
Are present day evils simply the logical outcome of this fatal flaw? Or do current maladies result from a fundamentally sound principle gone awry for other reasons? So that, that pretty starkly outlines the uh, disjunction here. Of course, we may find that uh, there's some of each in it, you know, that maybe there are some flaws in the beginning, but also a departure from what was good in the beginning. But that's, that's what we want to discuss is read this book. Well, I would say, Father, that the fight over these very different views of reality was going on at the time of the founding. In other <laughs> words, the yeah. streams of thought were in conflict with each other at the time. And it's really, and we can see from the French Revolution what going one direction would lead to. And that was, a, there were definitely pressures upon the founders to go in that direction. And it's, a, it's almost a miracle that they didn't, given the streams of thought and the intellectual fashions of the day. And so um, it isn't so much, I don't think that there's a convulsion occurring now as a first time event, but that it's actually a convulsion that's been going on for some time. And that at different times in history, one side gets the upper hand. And uh, it remains to be seen which side is going to get the upper hand right now in our own country. And looking back at those debates, uh, which are very beautifully uh, exposed in the Federalist Papers and also the Anti-Federalist Papers, uh, as an American, I mean, I'm an Italian-American and a German-French-American, too, I suppose, uh, the, the you know, grandson of immigrants, I'm proud of what I see in our founders. If I were not American at all, I would still be in awe at the intellectual ability they had and the articulateness they had in expressing it. And so when, when you read the Federalist Papers, which, by the way, if you haven't read them, uh, anyone watching or listening to this, I recommend it very highly, if nothing else, to see what newspaper articles were like in the 1700s. These were newspaper articles people were writing back. I mean, it's, uh, it's marvelous when you, when you, when you realize the, the wisdom and the, the scholarship or the intelligence of these men. Uh, all right. Let's see. I have something on page four. That beats me. All right. He, he talks. <laughs> it doesn't beat you, but I, I, it precedes you. Anyway, uh, uh, he talks about the New York Times bestseller, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation by Rod Dreher, who is convinced by Notre Dame Professor Patrick Deneen that the American, quote, purpose of government is to liberate the autonomous individual, close quote. So uh, Patrick Deneen is kind of the protagonist here uh, against whom uh, Bob Riley is writing. And uh, Riley explains what this means, as Deneen states elsewhere, is that, quote, the summum bonum of our American civil religion is maximizing the opportunities for individuals to express and satisfy their desires, a belief that Orthodox Christianity by nature opposes. So that, that's what it is. That's the flaw that Deneen and others see here. Uh, page five. Uh, he says, the Catholic natural law tradition has formed the grounding for the American proposition and was still strong enough to resist modern corrosives. If America lost her way, she could be recalled her better self by Catholic intellectuals steeped in that tradition. This is something that John Court Murray, the Jesuit political philosopher, had said, and uh, which... Uh, Bob Riley agrees with. And so what inspired Riley to write this book was that the Catholic intellectual tradition in this country was taking this new turn. In other words, that up until rather recently, um, for lack of a better word, you know, conservative Catholics or traditional Catholics or so on. Um, That's a good word, were, but go ahead. 
Yeah, but you know, I don't want it to turn. <laughs> right, into, I understand. <laughs> you know, political uh, usage, but um, that that tradition, uh, intellectual tradition, was. Um, in sync with Riley's thesis, it's only somewhat recently that we have Catholics of that kind now taking issue with the very principles of the founding themselves. And that's why Riley thought he should write a book, because uh, he obviously has drawn a, a different conclusion as to where the source of our problems lie, not with the principles, but with their misapplication. And, of course, it was a Catholic Supreme Court justice, Anthony Kennedy, who, in Casey versus Planned Parenthood, wrote that astoundingly, I would call it insane sentence, at the heart <laughs> of liberty is the right to determine one's own concept of meaning. Oh, right. really? I mean, if that isn't triumph of the will uh, and voluntarism, I don't know what is. That's exactly what it is. And so, uh, and, and so, but up until recently, there was a core of Catholic thinkers who all saw the absurdity of a Kennedy. And really, the shameful reality here's a man who probably enjoyed a Catholic upbringing and education and everything else, and he reaches the highest court in the land. And what does he do with that? Well, never mind. But, <laughs> you know. Riley used to be able to count on more people being in his camp who had good Catholic educations and backgrounds to be able to counter the likes of a Kennedy. One thing I would say, I think we do need to be fair here because Patrick Deneen uh, and Rod Dreher would obviously agree with uh, Robert Riley about the absurdity of Justice Kennedy's radical well, relativism. Oh, yes, so, of so course. The question, the question is whether or not that radical relativism can be taken back to the Constitution. That's the discussion. And exactly. obviously right. that's where Robert Wiley disagrees with Patrick Deneen. But obviously they all are on the same side as, as opposed to the madness of the radical relativism on the Supreme oh. Court. Oh, yes. Yeah. So maybe I better restate what I tried to say. Riley is saying that up until recently, there were more Catholic conservative intellectuals opposed to a Kennedy using their interpretation of the principles against a Kennedy. Now that camp is dwindling as more Catholics decide that, no, the reason why we have a Kennedy is because of the founding itself. You see, right. that's, been the diff that's been the change. Not that, not that Deneen agrees with Kennedy. Oh, no, heaven forbid. He's just, he's just placing the source of the Kennedy troubles someplace else. Exactly. Both and Riley and Deneen agree that this idea of radical autonomy is, is a terrible thing. The Correct. question is whether it comes from the Constitution or whether it comes from uh, neglecting the Constitution. That's the question. Correct. On page 10. Oh, oh I beat you. Okay, you preceded me. <laughs> well, you know, in a foot race, that amounts to the same yeah. thing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Very true. And very wise. No, I, 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 this is my first um, eyebrow-raising comment that I'm hoping is going to be clarified later because it's a statement which is not actually given uh, substance here. So at the bottom of page nine, he says, the sovereignty of the people, and then in parenthesis, all of which were in place well before the Enlightenment and therefore clearly not products of it. So I understand, of course, you know, Robert Wiley is wanting to, to, to distance the, um, the American Constitution from the Enlightenment. That, that's, that's fair enough. But I, I do need to know what he means by the sovereignty of the people, because obviously in a deeper sense, any Catholic understanding of political philosophy is that everything is sovereign to God, and, and any sovereignty that the people has is subject to God. Now, I know the Constitution says one nation under God, but I, I really want clarified what is meant by, first of all, the sovereignty of the people, and secondly, in what sense that was applicable, for instance, in Catholic medieval political philosophy. Very good, and he will answer that. I've actually read the book straight through twice now. Well, I'm expecting uh, but, but, him to. But that's good. But we'll, we'll note that down, and uh, we'll remind you when we get to the answer. Well, on the next page, Joseph, page 10, at the top, he says... This book, then, is not so much about the founding itself as about the providence of its ideas. 
Its purpose is to demonstrate that the ideas of democratic constitutional government have only one set of roots in human history. Christendom, strongly influenced by its antecedents in Jerusalem and Athens, and only Christendom has ever indigenously produced modern constitutional government. Now that's quite a thesis. Uh, he may be wrong, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see how he's going to try and prove it. So shall we go on I'm to... On to uh, I'm having a problem with the connection. Please try to... <laughs> <laughs> this phone, Siri... Heckled by a robot. I like that. Heckled by a robot. Siri, who, who will not answer my questions, and, and now she's turned her light on. <laughs> and throw this no phone. I'll throw that phone away. <laughs> Get rid of that thing. All right. We're on uh, chapter one, the legacies of Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome. And oh, that, just, 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 just to be, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call me, I do have one other thing I wanted to say on page 12 before we leave the introduction. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, and it's, it's just that um, I want to clarify something here again, and maybe he does it the same thing, but this, the, about 10 lines down on page 12, he says, with secular and spiritual power conjoined, divine right absolutism, absolutism shattered constitutionalism. And I do want to clarify one thing there. The whole thing about the divine right of kings was an aberration that had nothing to do with Catholic political philosophy, which begins with around the time of Charles I, and, and for very simple reasons, because he could see the rise of the Puritans, um, and if, if he didn't actually find some um, uh, justifi justification for monarchy, then uh, what could happen would be that monarchy would be deposed, and of course his son, Charles II, was beheaded. Um, so, sorry, that's James I, um, and, and Charles I was beheaded. So, uh, in other words, this is the 17th century political phenomenon, uh, which is not, I would suggest, part of the main root of Catholic political philosophy or indeed of intellectual tradition. So we need to clarify that. Maybe as he mentioned. And you will be something. happy to find, Joseph, that he says exactly that when we get to that point in the book. OK, good. You're, you're, pre yep. not, you're not only preceding me, you're prescient. <laughs> All right. On to page 15, chapter one, the first sentence. To appreciate the fundamental presuppositions of the American founding, we must first see what the world was like without them. I think it's a fascinating thing he does. He really describes the world prior to the antecedents, you know, both Jerusalem and, and Athens. I think it's phenomenal what he does here. Uh, but can I be the skeptic again? <laughs> can well, I be the skeptic? Hey, just page 16. Yes. Um, because, you know, again, I'm, I'm thinking of C.S. Lewis uh, and in the Pilgrim's Regress about when people could no longer read, the people of the landlord, God sent them pictures. Um, so I'm a bit worried about stereotyping pagans as, as all being absolutely brutal. So at the bottom of page uh, 16, a personal relationship with the gods was not possible for individuals. And I think about, you know, during the time of the ancient Romans, the household gods, Every, every household had its own particular gods that it was part of their family. A um, bit like Catholics, they're not gods, of course, but, you know, we, we have different devotions to various saints. So that would be that would vary from family to family. So I think there was a personal relationship. And then at the top of page 17, man felt himself at every moment dependent upon his gods. Well, so what's so shocking about that? I mean, we feel ourselves at every moment dependent upon a, a, the god. All right. So, um, I, you know, he does... I know he nuances it, but I, I, I'm a bit concerned about the fact that everything was absolutely horrible. Oh, Joseph, you, you, you stopped at the comma of that sentence. And consequently upon the man felt himself at every moment dependent upon his gods, comma, and consequently upon the priest king who was placed between them and himself. So his point, his main point here is the union of priest and king, that is the state and religion. But I think yeah. you're right. I mean, he may he may exaggerate the inability right. of uh, 
You know, I mean, you know, I'm just worried about, you know, in order to make your case, and he's very, he doesn't need to do this because he's very eloquent and lucid, but in order to make your case, you demonize the, the enemy, right? And well, I, I don't think right. you need to be doing it in that level. Well, let's not forget that the Greek philosophers he admires so much are pagans. So he, he's not saying that nothing good can come from paganism. He's simply showing you, he's sketching you, I think, a general uh, uh, relationship between the individual person and his government, which prior to Greek philosophy, prior to Judaism and its fulfillment in Christianity was really a very different thing from how we understand that relationship. In fact, as he points out, the demarcation between secular and sacred is impossible in the pre-philosophical world. So I agree, maybe a statement, no personal relationship in these sorts of things might strike you as too strongly stated. But I think if you look at what he's doing you appreciate the difference he's showing I you. Because this, I, I, have, yeah. I have no problem at all, Vivian, with the broad stroke approach, but I do think we need to be fair. Yes. And, if, and, and, it's, and it's good to act. You're going to win the case better if you actually, you know, give credence, credence where it's due to, to your enemy. So That's right. And I, I think uh, it, it, it helps to take the first sentence in that paragraph called The Pre-Philosophical World, he says, we begin with what life was like without philosophy, monotheism, or Christ. In the pre-philosophical world of city-states or cosmological empires, there was no demarcation between civic order and religious life. So I, I think that general principle is true, even though it's not true to say, therefore, no individual could have any relationship with God. You know, right. I, yeah, I'm happy with that. That's one of the reasons. I want to put the brakes on if I think that we're just going gun home. That's good, okay. Uh, page 23. You precede me, Father. All right. <laughs> uh, Two-thirds down. The current loss of the transcendent in the West has led to the Mother Earth or Gaia-type environmental movement, which is basically a return to a form of ancient pantheism. Its adherents may be unaware that this will lead ineluctably to re of the state to which they will be subject. That's a, I mean, that's a parenthetical remark he makes there, but I think it's, a, it's one to ponder. I will then jump to 36. Uh, well, I have something on 33 I wouldn't mind commenting on. Go ahead, go ahead. It's Go not ahead. going to be skeptical. It's going to be buttressing. Um, so uh, about eight lines down, um, this is Socrates speaking. Men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice and teaching of philosophy, end quote. Nothing could have illustrated more dramatically or taught more powerfully the ultimate incongruity of the spiritual and political orders than the death of Socrates. Now, I did want to con con comment here about this sort of a continuum because this issue, which we see in the trial of Socrates, you also see in, 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 Sof uh, in Sophocles' play Antigone, uh, you know, where yes. basically yeah. religious freedom um, precedes the power of the state. So this was something uh, that existed with the playwrights. And, that, and of course, uh, Sophocles is the same sort of time as uh, as, as the great Greek philosophers, and then, of course, reiterated in, in, in plays such as King Lear, where Cordelia has to choose to love and be silent because she won't play the king's game about the king being uh, all in all. Amen. And unfortunately, she ran afoul of the silence is violence mentality, right? Is <laughs> unfortunately, people who try to keep silence are often considered guilty uh, by that and suffer injustice as a result of well, that. Well, she was exiled, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And, and, and we could talk more. We should sometimes maybe do the Sophocles cycle of plays on this show. That would be a lot of fun, Joseph, because I have a different, just a slightly different take on Antigone than simply a matter of the gods are higher than men argument. But um, how you go about it also matters. To be continued. <laughs> 
to be confirmed. All right. Well, on page 36, then, this is a very important sentence, middle of the page. The immense importance of the Athenian legacy for 18th century Americans was that the new nation would not have come into being without the understanding of nature as normative, of nature as normative. You know, yes. not too long ago we had, we may, we may still have this uh, false dichotomy between facts and values. You know, you can't derive values from facts. Well, yes, you can, because from what is, which is defined by its telos, its goal, you can determine what ought to be for that being. I mean, that's the whole thing about the natural law. But we exactly. partly that loss of the natural law tradition is, I think, which led us to we can redefine our gender, we can redefine our sexuality, we can redefine what marriage means and procreation. Well, yeah, if there's no natural law out there, you can, as Justice Kennedy told us, you can make up your own. That's right. Um, that and, is of course, and of course, suffer the consequences by, um, by going against reality. Ultimately, reality is going to win. And uh, this, this whole uh, pride agenda is going to play itself out. Uh, it's how much damage it does, both to its practitioners and its victims, uh, prior to that happening. That's there, right. There was a great Jewish family doctor who became a Catholic, uh, and his name will come in a moment, maybe. But uh, he said, I don't know if this originated from him or not, but he said, frequently said, God always forgives. Man sometimes forgives. Nature never forgives. That you <laughs> violate nature, it's like trying to violate yeah. gravity, you know? Yeah. That's right. Page 42, anything before that? I'm going to let you roll, Father. Yep. The, the Jewish, it's four lines from the top, the Jewish and then Christian teaching on the original origin of evil became the most powerful antidote to fanatical political prospects aimed at the metaphysical renovation of reality. I mean, I mean, some of these sentences of his should be chiseled in stone somewhere. Oh, yeah. you know? He writes very well, and his mind is absolutely razor sharp. I did want to bring something up on that page of a Kang, the footnote here. And, and if we can read these words, and, uh, you know, this this sounds very similar to the sort of anarchists and nihilists who are... Uh, rising up in Oregon and, 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 and uh, uh, Seattle and other places. This is Hitler, right, in Mein Kampf. He said, we, we're going to, a proclamation is a declaration of war against the order of things which exist, against the state of things which exist, in a word, against the structure of the world which presently exists. In other words, the problem is it's systemic, Right. Uh, and we have to destroy the system, bring everything down to nothing so we can build our 1,000-year Reich, a 1,000-year Reich in its place. Now, whether that Reich is on the, you know, the jackboots on the left foot or the right foot doesn't really matter. It's the same nihilism, ultimately, that drives the anarchists on the left and the Nazis on the right. But surely in our time, no one would have a position like that, would they, Joseph? <laughs> yeah, ask, ask, ask the BLM people without <laughs> going any further. <laughs> Uh, okay. And the irony there, of course, right? The BLM people on the same page as Adolf Hitler. There's the irony. That's probably, right. They're probably going to cancel our website now, but uh, <laughs> on page 46. That's good. Bottom paragraph, penultimate. We shall now see how and in what ways Christianity shaped this new civilization through the elevation of the status of reason, the de-divinization of the world, and the recognition of the inviolability of the human person and the freedom of the human will. Again, beautiful summation of what we're founded on. Um, right, and Father... I was about to say here, actually... Oh, sorry, please, Vivian. I was just going to say that uh, what we jumped over to get to that point is first he points out how the Greek philosophers, at least some of them, articulated these things. And he also shows the monotheism of Judaism and also the key revelation of Judaism that man is created in the image of God. 
That is going to be repeated over and over in this book as the key back to your question about where does sovereignty lie, Joseph? If you believe that man is created in the image of God, that is the key that unlocks the answer to that question. Uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying that's, well, being made in the image of God is not the same thing as being God. That's the difference between pride and humility. Uh, and I, know, I know that's not what you were saying, but I mean, I think that's not what he says. But if we've been given reason in order to apprehend reality and conform ourselves to reality and have our workings of society and our laws conforming to what is, that's what Robert Riley's talking about. Uh, and that key insight flows from man being created in the image of God. Yes, man is not God. He never says that. It's the other people who are saying that. The oh, people who end up putting totalitarian, the right. people who put in totalitarian systems want to make themselves gods. Right, which is why I wanted to clarify that it made the image of God is not the same thing as sovereignty in the sense that they understand it. Um, one thing I, I would say as well is that towards the end of the rest of the large part of the rest of this chapter, I'm going to summarize this and I'm going to be quiet and let uh, <laughs> the rest of you speak. But but there's some wonderful selections of quotes here, and, and much of which was new to me. I mean, the one which isn't new to me, I mean, the big, top of page 45, when he quotes from the first chapter of John's Gospel and, 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 and you know, talking about the Logos, um, that's absolutely crucial. It's it, That's the Gospel foundation. But then St. Clement of Alexandra, um, with faith and reason, and then various popes against slavery um, l later on. I mean, this is just, and, and it, this is, our father used the word prescient earlier, but this is really prescient, because obviously this was written last year or the year before, or whatever, and you know, th this really is coming alive now as part of something, it's part of what's happening on our streets as we speak. Yes. Well, a couple of quick ones here on page 52 about three quarters of the way down. The secular is not antithetical to Christianity. It is a product emphasized of it. Christianity created the secular. It insists on it. I mean, now this is summing up what he's said, giving different historical uh, examples here, but that is so important to realize that it's Christianity that gave us separation of church and state. That's right. Uh, if I, my, I mean, he talks up and he does talk about uh, render other Caesar that which is Caesar. I don't know where that is, but that's that's yes. exact. That that gives 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 the scriptural foundation for what he's saying here. Yeah, that was one of the most stunning exactly. statements of Christ. Actually, you know, to say I am who I am. Okay, you know, I am. That was really stunning to the Jews. But to say that give to Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God's that was unheard of. That was that was a total like an aerolith coming down out, out of the sky. No no antecedents to that. Well, my final little quote here, again, it's a summary of what he's saying uh, in a, the paragraph, page 54, a third of the way down. Thus, politics is not the salvific engine for the transformation of mankind and the elimination of evil. Christ is. I am um, highlighted exactly the same words, exactly the same words. Maybe and that's really, a, I was just going to say, that's sort of a perfect place to stop uh, if, if, we're, if we're running out of time. Uh, that is going to be a key thing that he brings up over and over again, that people who try to ascribe to politics the engine of man's salvation always create tyranny. Very good. So for next week, we will take chapters two and three the medieval roots of constitutionalism, and the loss of reason and nature. Thanks for joining us on the Form Book Club. God bless you all. See you next week. <laughs>